This is our 44th lesson. Uh, actually, it's 45 because we divided one of them into two parts. But we'll still call by the lesson number 44. Let's call it that. <clears throat> We're on our last lesson on parables. <clears throat> we could have a whole class on the parables by looking at each one individually, particularly of the Lord's parables. Uh, but we're going to look at some other parables and how it's used, uh, how the expression parable was used in the ancient literature. So we're looking at some additional parables or what are called parables, as uh, they included a, a number of different figures of speech. And we'll look at some other aspects of parables as well in our discussion. In Ezekiel 17, 1, <clears throat> the American Standard reads, And the word of Jehovah came unto me, saying, Son of man, put forth a riddle, and speak a parable unto the house of Israel, and say, Thus saith the Lord Jehovah, great eagle with two great wings, and long pinions full of feathers, which and divers colors came unto Lebanon and took the top of the cedar. And he cropped off the topmost of the young twigs thereof and carried it under the land of traffic. He sat in the city of merchants, took also the seed of the land and planted it in a fruitful soil. He placed it beside many waters. He set it as a willow tree. And it grew and became a spreading vine of low stature, whose branches turned toward him, <clears throat> and the roots there were under him. So it became a vine and brought forth branches and shot forth sprigs. In this right here, we see the use of the word parable, or what might be uh, a different figure of speech. If we look at this, this uh, certainly could be a different figure of speech. Um, and it's not like the parables of Jesus, but it's still called a parable. And so we need to get into Ezekiel to get a little more thoroughly to see what he's talking about there. But uh, I think he's talking about Israel going into captivity, right? In Luke 4, we see Proverbs, some things what we might call Proverbs. And in this case here, and he said unto them, Ellis, you will say unto me this parable, and <clears throat> physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done at Capernaum, do also here in thine own country. So again, this is more of a proverb. And so it's used in a broader sense. If you get into it, it's used in a broader sense than we've been using it with the parables of Jesus. Here it would be a proverb. <clears throat> now we see uh, another parable, and it's more like a similitude. And he said, so is the kingdom of heaven, as if a man cast seed upon the earth, and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring up and grow, he knoweth not how. The earth beareth fruit of herself, first the bride, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the fruit is ripe, shall we put forth the sickle, because the harvest is come. In this case here, it's a similitude. But it's called in this context, it's a series of parables. And so it's a similitude. Kingdom is as if a man cast seed upon the earth. And the expression, the words as if are used to introduce a similitude or a simile. This is an extended simile. That's what a similitude is. And so we find then it's used in a little bit different way. So we need to look at simile, similes and, and metaphors, and, and it will it will uh, carry those as part of its definition uh, as we look at it. In Hebrews nine and uh, verse nine, 
which is a figure, and that's parabola. That's the word for parable. For the time present, according to which are offered both gifts and sacrifices that God out as touching the conscience, make the worshiper perfect or full grown perfect. So again, in this case, it's called the parable, parabola. And figures, it's a figure of speech, which is a figure. And again, we get into a different figure of speech now. So our definition of parables is broad, is narrower than what they've used. And, and in fact, the word parable A is used here for it. And again, we come to the parables of Balaam. And he took up his parable and said, from Aram hath Balak brought me the king of Moab from the mountains of the east. Come curse me, Jacob, and come defy Israel. How shall I curse whom God hath not cursed, and how shall I defy whom Jehovah hath not defied? See right here, now he calls it a parable. For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him, lo, it is a, it is a people that dwelleth alone shall not be reckoned among the nations, <clears throat> who shall count the dust of Jacob, or number the fourth part of Israel. Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last end be like his. And again, right here, it's called a parable. And it's not like the parables of Jesus. So again, we find, as he goes on and and he took up the, his parable is another one. And this is Numbers 23. All right, and this was 23, 9 and 10. We come up to Numbers 23, 18, another parable. And he took up his parable and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear, hearken unto me, thou son of Zippor. This is Balaam's parable. God is not a man that he should lie. He's the son of man that he should repent. As he said, and will he not do it? Or as he spoken, and will he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. Again, he was trying to curse Israel, but as a prophet, he couldn't. So again, this is called a parable again. In Numbers 23, 21, back up a minute, the next verse continues. He has not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. Jehovah his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God bringeth them forth out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a wild ox. Surely there is no enchantment with Jacob, neither is there any divination with Israel. Now hath it now shall it be said of Jacob and of Israel. What hath God wrought? Behold, the people rises up as a lioness, and as a lion doth he lift himself up. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink the blood of the slain. <clears throat> Let me back up to a wild ox, if you can look at it. There is a wild ox in India that is pretty large and fearsome. It's and uh, even Lot, even uh, the tigers have trouble taking them down, and so uh, they are they are quite strong. And it might be that these wild oxes were in that region, and uh, they're in India at this very time. <clears throat> so the parables of Balaam right here, uh, these parables that we see of Balaam gave. Numbers 23, 7 through 9, and so forth. And on the slide here, you see the passages. They contain similes, similitudes, which is an extended simile. Uh, the difference between a metaphor and a simile is saying this is like this or this is as this. That's a simile. And so we could say uh, he is as strong as an ox. That's a simile. He is an ox. That is a metaphor. And you don't use the compare words of comparison. And so a simile or a similitude would be an extended similitude, just an extended simile. So these contain three things, similes and similitudes, 
long extended similes and prophetic statements cast in figures of speech. So he was speaking prophetically as a prophet Balaam was. They, they're not parables in the sense we use, that we use the word, but since the ancient people use the word parable in a much broader sense than we do, it was under that general heading. Or laid side by side for comparison purposes. See, that's what a simile would do. So they used it in a broader sense. I've, I've confined my parables mostly to what Jesus used because of his, the nature of his parables. We could think of them as extended metaphors as well. Maybe they don't even have the word like or as. At times, parables were used to cause the hearers to condemn themselves before the parable was interpreted. We see this in 2 Samuel 12, 1 through 6, 14, 1 through 24. <clears throat> and we went, we've gone through those as well in Matthew 21, 33 through 46, and 1 Kings 20. 35 through 43. All of these are parables that were set forth. And uh, when they're interpreted, uh, the person was stood condemned for some of his action when they're interpreted properly. When uh, the lesson is arrived at by the hearer or reader, the impression is stronger upon the mind of the hearer or reader. This is psychologically true. If I if I draw the conclusion myself, it's much stronger in my mind and in my thinking process than if someone just told me it was true. Because I can resist it. If I drew the conclusion myself, it's hard to, to cast it aside and not to, not to take it to heart. This is widely recognized in rhetoric. And people, if, if you study speech uh, in college, you'll learn what's called rhetoric. And the logic class, one of the first things we, dis we discussed was the topic of rhetoric. And so this is widely recognized in rhetoric as a technique to convince the audience. Uh, in logic, we talk about enthymemes. And it's an incomplete argument, and the hearer finishes the argument in his mind, and it becomes stronger. He becomes more convinced by it. And this is a powerful tool for doing that. <clears throat> if the listener is given the facts and part of the argument, then completes the argument for himself, he'll be strongly convinced of the soundness of the argument. That's the reason for it. It's psychologically, it's a rhetorical technique. It's psychologically true. And so it's very powerful or successful in convicting the hearer. In Matthew 21, 33, here's another parable. There was a man who was a householder who planted a vineyard and set a hedge about it and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husband and went into another country. When the season of the fruits drew near, he sent his servants to the husband to receive his fruits. And the husband took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. And again, he sent forth servants more than the first. They did unto them in like manner. But afterward, he sent them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But the husband, when they saw the son, said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and take his inheritance. They took him and cast him forth out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the Lord of the vineyard shall come, what shall he do unto those husbandmen? Now he is he asks this and gives this parable and asks the men that were seeking to kill him. They didn't realize this. They they were pulled into the parable. They say unto him, these are men that were eventually going to be involved in killing him, Jesus the Son. They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those miserable men and will set up that out the vineyard and to an other husband who shall render him the fruits of their seasons. They didn't see this at first as applicable to them. Jesus continued, he saith unto them, did you not read, never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected. There it is, see the builders rejected it. The builders would be the leaders of Israel at that time. The same was made the head of the corner. This was 
from the Lord and it's marvelous in our eyes. So he's quoting scripture now. And he says, therefore say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken away from you, you leaders of Israel and shall be given to a nation. This will be the spiritual nation, the church, bringing forth the fruits thereof. <clears throat> and he that falleth on this stone shall be broken to pieces, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will scatter him as dust. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parable, see, they're the ones that are the builders. They perceived that he spake of them. And when they sought to lay hold on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. We've already, we looked at this parable last week, I believe. But right here, we come back into it. We can see how he used it. The parable is used to lay them out and to expose them and get them to condemn themselves. They condemn themselves. And let's go back and see where they condemn themselves. And he says, they say unto him, he will miserably destroy those miserable men and they let out the vineyard unto the other husband through unto him the fruits in their seasons. Verse 41, from their own mouth, they condemn themselves because they were going to kill the son to take the vineyard. <clears throat> they wanted to continue to run Israel to be in charge. It was the loss of their power, their place that they feared, and it's the loss of their power that they feared. They weren't trying to protect Israel, the people of Israel. They were trying to defend their position in their place. Ancient people use the word parable to refer to proverbs, similitudes, figures, also certain similes. Parables of Balaam were similes and similitudes, and they were prophetic statements. And let's look at some other aspects of parables. They're extended metaphors, and so the word, the metaphor difference between a metaphor and a, and a, uh, a parable uh, and a simile, uh, a simile would be he is like a bull in a china closet. That's a simile. And he, he is a bull in a china closet is a, is a metaphor. The, that's the difference. One of them uses the word like or as to compare it as weaker. And it's stronger to say he's a bull in a china closet. That is a metaphor. And they're, they accomplish the same thing, but one of them uses words to tell you it's experience, and the other one just says he's a bull in a Santa Claus. Parables are extended metaphors, think of them that way. They don't always use the word like or as. Many times parables were used to cause the hearers to condemn themselves. We've seen the passage in Luke, Matthew 21, but we see it in other places. You saw it with David and uh, and Nathan and other places. Parables are an excellent rhetorical technique and as they convince the mind to get into psychology. And since the hearer that and sometimes they even condemn themselves. We see this in David and, and uh, the parable of the little ewe lamb, the man, the poor man with his little ewe lamb. And uh, he condemned himself. And we see the king, I believe it was King Ahab condemned himself. And we see here in this one, the, the scribes and Pharisees and the rulers, they condemned themselves in the 21st chapter of Matthew. Now then, are there any questions about the parables? Okay, this ends this lesson. We will pick up uh, in August. We'll pick up again with our lessons and uh, we'll, we'll be working there, uh, laying out in August. Okay. And uh, we'll end our class today.